We okay, David? Tape's rolling. Tape's rolling. Okay, tape is rolling. Um, regarding your origins as a science fiction writer, I guess in the, in the late 1940s, can you recall the circumstances that started you off as a writer? Did you, for instance, start as a fan? Or how did you pick up the science fiction? Oh, well, it happened I had been reading science fiction for oh, quite a few years. Um, I wasn't a fan because I, in the usual sense of the word, because I didn't know any other people to speak of who read this stuff. Uh, but I used to write stories as a as a hobby, and uh, just for my own amusement, really. Mm. But eventually, in co while in college, I got to talking with a friend I had then who also read science fiction, as it turned out. And in the course of conversation, an idea developed that I thought would make a good story, so I went ahead and wrote it. And he uh, read it and urged me to send it in. So I borrowed a typewriter, not owning one at the time myself, and um, prepared a manuscript and sent it in, and quite some time went by. I'd almost forgotten about it all, when much to my surprise, I got an acceptance. Um, and after that, I sold a few other things. I was, I was still studying to become a physicist and graduated, but graduated into a recession when jobs were hard to find, so I thought I'd try supporting myself for a while as a freelance writer uh, while looking around for more steady employment, but somehow that while got longer and longer and longer. Okay, uh, in other words, you decided to go to be a full-time writer right after you graduated from college is really when the decision no, was made. No, I didn't make that decision immediately. I sort of drifted into it in the course of the next year or so. Uh, the same way as most people really drift into whatever careers they end up in. Okay, I had I had a, a couple of questions about your your future history. Um, yours, I believe, is a lot tighter than some of the others that I've read. Did you start off your future history with a deliberate plan to uh, you know with charts, with timelines, with the whole thing, or did it just grow? Well, this is a a rather interesting and, to me, and certainly complicated matter, <laughs> how much of a story do you want on it? Oh, I don't know, just at, uh, yeah. just about the origins, maybe the genesis yeah. of, of, the, of, of how you started, the when, at the yeah. point at which you got the idea you had a future history in hand. Yeah, okay, well, there have actually been been two plus a couple of others that you might can perhaps call many future histories. That is to say, um, three or four stories on the same timeline, no more. But I started out originally rather early in my career and more or less uh, inspired by Heinlein's future history and constructed one of my own uh, with charts and background material and so on like his. Of, co of course mine was, in mine the events were different, but basically I wanted to do a similar job that is fictionally tell about the story of mankind from um, almost the present day up at least until the early era of expansion among the stars. This wasn't going to be the only thing I did by any means. Just like Asimov, I would write other things that were not in the series. But um, from 
time to time I'd add something to it, and I did over the years. But gradually, for a number of reasons, got less and less interested in continuing and started phasing it out, doing less and less of it. One reason for being less interested was that as for the early part of it, uh, reality was catching up with me. Not only were uh, public or political events not working out on my timetable, for example, World War III did not come off on schedule, but um, also it turned out I had failed to foresee a number of scientific and technological developments. So I was going into other things. Um, then, but you're probably thinking, though, about this much larger and more enduring project of mine, which, um, which well, has sometimes been called the League and Empire series or something like that. Um, now that is, has a history much more like that of Topsy, it just grew. Um, originally I'd written a few stories about Nicholas Van Rijn, and uh, I'd written a few stories about Dominic Flandry, who lived in completely different milieus, of course. And then one day on an impulse, uh, I thought, well, gosh, uh, they, could, they could be on the same timeline, one living about 500 years after the other. And threw in mention of that in one of the once one of the Flandry stories, and then started fitting in other stories wherever it was convenient. Uh, you see, the thing with the future history is that although each story should, of course, be readable independently of any others and comprehensible and so on. Nevertheless, uh, if you have a reader who remembers a number of them, the uh, cross-connections will add an extra dimension and thereby, I hope, add to his enjoyment. So, I started doing it that way, and after a while I realized I had a rather large beast by the tail. If I was going to stay consistent at all, um, then I had to keep careful notes, and I had to develop a systematic scheme and so on. And thus, over the years, one thing led to another until it all became rather elaborate. By now, it includes, um, oh, I think, something like 40 separate items, of which probably at least a third or so are are full dress novels, but I probably carried it uh, carried it about as far as it can go. I doubt I'll do much more, if anything, in that line. And instead, I'd rather go on to something else. Yeah, the uh, I've heard it called the uh, the first portion of that the larger future history called the Polysotechnic League yes. about von Rhein and David yes. Falcane. Um, did you model that on on? European trading leagues during the Renaissance, the uh, the history behind that, the, the model? Oh, I was, I was drawing some historical parallels, of course. Uh, you could, uh, in the case of that phase of it, you could, um, you can see some obvious parallels to things like, say, the Medieval Hanseatic League. Uh, and, of course, also to the Age of Discovery a little later. Um, on the other hand, uh, when you get into the imperial part of it, say the Dominic Flandry stories, uh, the parallels there are to other things, like, for example, the Byzantines versus the Persians a conflict which went on for centuries and wore out both parties. Uh, I don't... I've, I, I've never tried to force these things too much. Uh, his, history never repeats ex itself exactly. And for that matter, um, I don't think that... Uh, well, I don't... I, I don't 
think it ever could repeat itself that exactly anyway. A number of the things that I throw in there are not meant to be taken literally. For example, aristocratic titles and so on. I don't think anybody's ever going to revive them in just that form. They're just meant to suggest uh, approximate equivalence. Okay, I imagine that uh, Nicholas von Rhein, uh, I imagine he's been one of your more popular characters uh, oh, yes. in terms of reader response, hasn't he been? Oh, yes. Uh, he, uh, there are some readers who can't stand him, but uh, they don't ignore him either. And uh, as, as for the rest, uh, he probably is the most popular character I've ever come up with. And the, the first novel about him would be, I think your title was The Man Who Counts, is that right. correct? Right. Well, it's been reissued under that title lately, yes. Okay, just a, a brief question about Dominic Flandry. Um, of course, in con contrast to Von Rhein, he's very sophisticated and suave and so forth. Was there anything of James Bond in him, or am I just reading that in? No, I've been asked this before, and as a matter of fact, the first Flandry story appeared something like 20 years before the first James Bond story did. If I was modeling on any other character at all, it would probably have had to be somebody like the Saint. Okay. Uh, and of course, at the, at the end of that, that historical uh, spectrum that you're giving, I guess, the post-Empire, the uh, mm -hmm. an immense time in the future, I believe... Wasn't Star Fog, I think, the last story in terms of chronology, mm -hmm. where uh, humanity's, I guess, it's scattered. They've even forgotten where Earth is. But there's yeah. nothing beyond that that you've written, uh, beyond that, that, chrono that point? No, I haven't carried it any further than that. And as a matter of fact, uh, it gets... A after Flandry's period, it begins to become very sporadic. Um, well, for example... Readers quite often ask me exactly what did happen uh, after Flandry's lifetime. What what did the Terrans and the Marseillans do to each other? What what became of all these nearby peoples, etc.? And all I have to say is that I don't know exactly. These. Uh, Post-imperial stories you mentioned take place way off on the fringes or even beyond, and uh, there they don't know either. Okay, to change the subject in, in a small way here, uh, regarding world building, um, I've read your essay on the subject, you know, about uh, building worlds and so forth. Yeah. Can you just briefly explain the term and why you've uh, you spent so much time uh, world building in your novels and stories? Well, I mean, the, all right. The term, oh, uh, the term simply means to the, uh, simply refers to the construction of an imaginary world as a setting for a story in considerable detail. Now, lots of people have done this. Uh, an obvious example, for example, would, would be... Um, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, in The Lord of the Rings and related stories, uh, he constructs an imaginary world in vast detail, complete down to fine points of the various languages spoken and so on. Um, so it's, and certainly nothing unique to me, um, in, in science fiction rather than fantasy, um, Hal Clement, of course, has been the master of this sort of thing for many years. Um, now, this, now, there's probably a twofold reason, or, or maybe even a threefold reason, for doing it like this. Well, in the first place, it's fun. I I enjoy reading it. I, I enjoy doing it, and I hope. It's really quite fascinating to sit down there with your references and your calculator and so on and see the these somewhat uh, sometimes unexpected details emerge. 
And I hope it's fun for the reader, too, afterward. Mm. Then in the second place, um, I think that that it helps. Uh, it, it helps stories a great deal to have a background that is worked out in great detail. Um, after all, uh, we really cannot reasonably expect that any other planet anywhere in the universe will be very much like Earth. We'll probably be lucky if we find a few where humans can live without artificial help. And you're certainly not going to have native humans around there, or oak trees, or rabbits, or any other feature that we know here on Earth. Uh, that's, just, that's just preposterous to suppose on the basis of everything we know about the evolution of life here on Earth. So, in that case, let's try to set up some of the uh, features which are different. After all, one reason people read science fiction is precisely that they like to get away from the world around them once in a while and escape into something exotic. And in my, in my opinion, to the extent that this exotic thing can be made at the same time realistic and convincing, uh, the reader is getting his money's worth. Okay, both uh, both you and Hal Clement, I think, have spoken of this world building as, as sort of a game where you you see if the reader can find uh, some things about the world maybe that's, that's uh, out of place. Have you ever gotten responses from readers who have tried to point out perhaps scientific inaccuracies or or things of that sort in your novels and stories? Oh yes, yes, quite a bit. Um, as a matter of fact, this sort of thing is what Hal Clement himself has christened the game. Uh, the game consists in an author setting up a world or a situation or something as the very best he can and writing a story about it. And then then that's all he can do. He, he, he's made his move and that's it. And readers are free to thereafter to try to figure out from the story exactly what he had in mind and exactly where he may have gone wrong. So I've gotten some very interesting mail on technical points. Um, and, yes, uh, sometimes they have um, indicated to me that I've goofed on this or that detail, but all right. One learns from that. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, that sort of leads me into another question about one of uh, another one of your works, I think, that's uh, extremely well-known, Tau Zero. Yes. Would you agree that, uh, my, my impression is, I'm not sure that you'd agree with this, that it's probably your, your hardest science story? Uh, it's certainly one of them, yes. Um, I think of all your books, that probably has the largest scope, I guess, the most grand view of, of, of humanity and the universe and so forth. I suppose you, you, know, you, you believe in the Big Bang theory about the origin of the universe then, since Well, at least I assume that for purposes of that story. Yeah. Um, the the two characters in that book, Lindgren and Raymont, um, I took them to be sort of the, the two sides to human nature, say. She's uh, compassionate, emotional. Raymond is more uh, logical and more survival-oriented. Were you perhaps saying that you, you need both to survive, that both of those people had to pull the, the ship through so they could perhaps survive? Well, to some extent, yes, there is a certain symbolism there, um, but uh, it isn't meant to be taken too literally. That is to say, I don't, I don't write uh, parables or anything like that. I just try to write stories with people in them who are as real as I can make them, 
and um, so there were these different personality types interacting, and I wasn't trying to preach any lesson, merely to tell a story, but um, yes, I suppose you could say it, the story reflects what is, after all, a very ordinary fact of life, that it takes more than one kind of uh, person to keep a community going. Would you say that uh, the this plot, as you've constructed it in that book, and having them see the birth of a new universe and so forth, is something like that theoretically possible? Because they never did go beyond the speed of light, if I remember. Never did go beyond what? The speed of light. In other words, is the book theoretical? Oh, no, no, yeah. No, I, uh, uh, I tried to stay strictly within uh, relativistic physics there. Uh, it interested me to push that to the limits without doing anything that um, any physicist today, even a conservative one, would say was absolutely impossible. Well, as a matter of fact, I've gotten some arguments since on this detail and that. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the thing that, things that makes it fun to be a hard science fiction writer. You do get such interesting arguments. But anyhow, uh, were, were, were you trying to make a point beyond that, please? No, no, I was just ba basically asking if, if that kind of, at first glance, it seems like a, an unbelievable thing, but theoretically then it would be possible if the Big Bang Theory was correct, if that could happen. Well, well, the theory could be argued, and has been argued, and I could give you a number of the technical arguments I've gotten, but unless you have an audience of physicists, uh, your listeners might be left somewhat uh, in the dark. Um, the thing is, I, uh, I structured that novel very carefully. Um, If you take a close, if you take a close look at it, for example, you'll see that, with a couple of exceptions toward the end, um, each chapter takes just about ten times as long in cosmic times as uh, cosmic time as the one before. Uh, in other words, the book is written on a logarithmic scale. I did that because it, I got the idea of doing that from all of Stapledon, and um, it seemed to be the only way to convey any sense of the this enormous span, and it seems to have worked. And again, I um, oh, I drew plans for the spacecraft and tried to indicate in some detail exactly how it worked, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so about the first third of the book is pretty close to home, really, if you look at it. And it uh, doesn't involve much of anything that is seem, uh, seems, doesn't seem quite possible in principle right now. Just a, just a matter of improving the engineering a little bit. Um, then the next third, of course, gets farther out. And um, begins to push the limits of what physicists would agree was possible. And as for the last third, uh, you're really getting into a completely speculative uh, area there. Because, for example... Right now, we don't know if uh, the universe is going to recycle or not. In fact, at the moment, the evidence seems to be slightly against it. Uh, but maybe there is enough matter, after all, floating around to pull it back together. And if there is going to be another collapse and another big bang, we don't know exactly what character it will have and so on. So this is really all rather far out. Uh, 
even though, as I say, I did try at least to keep it within the limits of relativistic mechanics. Uh, this is, as I say, part, uh, part of the game. Um, you know, the, the, the Hal Clement game. Given, given certain assumptions, uh, just what can you and can you not get away with? Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> I want to change the direction just for a second here. Um, okay. A uh, question about character. I've read critics and readers both who, who maintain that science fiction is a literature of ideas and plot and that it's notoriously weak on character. But after reading your work, uh, I, you know, that's questionable because you never fail to develop people and make them real. Well, thank you. Do you uh, would you agree that science fiction is generally weak on characterization at the expense of ideas? Well, science fiction as a considered in, an, in its entirety everything ever written that you could call science fiction is on the average weak in character, yes, but then so is uh, practically every other kind of fiction you can name, including the so-called mainstream. Um, you, look at, you look at the typical novel on today's bestseller list, you know, a, a, a here and now novel, whatever it may be. Uh, I, don't, I don't really find any kind of uh, Dostoevsky in depth in the characters there either. Um, so about all I really have to say is that some science fiction seems to me to have had well-developed characters, just as some other kinds of fiction, any other kinds, have had well-developed characters, and the rest has not, and after all, um, character is not the only thing in the universe there is to write about. This, uh, the, 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 this is one fallacy that literary critics seem to be hung up on. Um, you don't get Dostoevsky in depths of character either in Homer for example but that's still great literature it simply deals with other aspects of reality I don't I, I don't think you can compress the entire universe uh, into any one work of literature the universe is just too big and complicated so, so you have to decide what aspect you want to concentrate on Okay, um, let me switch, switch to another, another aspect of your work. Um, this is one that particularly fascinates me, is your use of, uh, of ancient history, myth, legend, the Middle Ages, things uh -huh. of that sort. Uh, I assume that you sort of grew up with an interest in that area. Uh, oh, yes. Did you, I mean, do you do research to get that kind of background, or do you just uh, naturally have it? Oh, it depends. Um if I happen to have the information for something at my fingertips, well, as a matter of fact, if I happen to have the information at my fingertips, then I have learned to tell myself, uh, oh boy, I better check that again, because very often a lot of what I know has turned out to be not true. Uh, so I always try to do as much research as possible, and then, of course, uh, there are areas that I know very little about to start with and have to uh, study up. I mean, for, uh, for example, I have a pretty good background in the archaeology and early history of uh, northern Europe. when I was writing The Dancer from Atlantis, which is set in the Mediterranean area of the Bronze Age, uh, then I really had to go out and do an awful lot of study. What about, <clears throat> what about, <clears throat> pardon me, what about Three Hearts and Three Lions? Uh, uh -huh. 
I imagine that's been one of your most well-received books. Would that be... Oh, yes. It, yeah, yes, it's uh, one of the most popular things I've ever done. Uh, and it was a hell of a lot of fun to write, I may say. It just sort of flowed out. I was going to ask you about Holger. Is it is, is, uh -huh. is, is it pronounced Holger? Holger Carlson, is that the way? Well, or, that's that's about as close as you can come in English, yes. Okay. Uh, was that based on a, I think it was, based on a, a, a man of legend and myth? I mean, you, yeah, uh, uh, yes, the book explicitly says so, uh, that it draws on the... Uh, medieval legend and the later medieval romances about uh, Ochiel de um, who was certainly there in medieval literature, if not in reality. Uh, of course, in that, in that case, it was a pure romp into a purely imaginary world. Uh, I didn't have to be much concerned with historical facts, uh, only with trying to make the world self-consistent. Okay, did uh, you, you use the character in another novel, uh, Midsummer Tempest? Uh -huh. uh, that's not exactly a sequel, though, is it? You you have right. Holger in it in the book, but uh, would you repeat, please? Uh, that book, A Midsummer Tempest. Yes. Even though Holger is in it, that's not exactly a sequel, is it? It's uh, no, that's that's kind of a cameo appearance, just just just, just for fun. In other words, since the Shakespearean world was ob obviously had to be in an alternate universe, and since Three Hearts and Three Lions had also explicitly been in another universe, and obviously likewise um, Operation Chaos had been in yet another, one that seems to have departed from ours about the year 1900, I thought, um, oh, what the heck, just, just for fun, let's tie all these together in one very brief scene that doesn't commit anybody to anything. And did it. Uh, it, it was just for fun. Okay. Uh, incidentally, you may or may not know that some of the very latest thought in uh, quantum mechanics uh, indicates that very possibly this uh, repeated splitting and creation of whole new universes really does go on. One thing that I find uh, unusual in your work, uh, fascinated by it, in fact, is that in some cases you can be a, a very hard science writer, but you still have this tremendous knowledge of and use of, say, the Middle Ages. Um, do you believe the Middle Ages was a, a better place for man? I mean, is your fascination sort of a longing for the, the kinds of, of way of life they had, a pre-technological civilization, or...? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Good heavens, no. Um, uh, the middle... Uh, from your viewpoint or mine, uh, it would have been a perfectly ghastly time to be alive in, unless you happen to be one of the very, very few that were fortunate, and even then you'd probably have had the teeth rot out of your head before you were 40 years old, or, you know, and been lucky to reach, uh, been an old man by the time you were 50, you know, been lucky to reach 60, um, been subject to all sorts of filthy things, uh, not, well, not to mention the fact that there have been very, very few eras in history where the average person could consider himself a free man. As a matter of fact, it's still a rarity today. Um, you, you, you and I as Americans are ex scarcely know how fortunate we are in that respect. So, although I am interested in the past, uh, I certainly don't want to romanticize it. Uh, every, every once in a while, just for fun, uh, you know, I'll take off in a completely imaginary sort of sanitized thing like, well, as in Three Hearts and Three Lions, for instance, but uh, then this is fr very frankly a fantasy. It's not supposed to be anything real. What about the High Crusade? Um, mm -hmm. That book has always fascinated me. Um, the, the, the juxtaposition there, you know, between a, 
a middle a primitive society from the Middle Ages and a, a highly technical galactic yeah. civilization. You weren't making any statement then about technology because the uh, the, the the people from the Middle Ages seem about ready to conquer a galactic empire with swords. <laughs> no, no, far from being a statement, it was, that was a book which I enjoyed writing, but became increasingly difficult to write as I went along. Because, of course, the whole situation is preposterous. Uh, the first third of the book or so could happen by a fluke, given the assumptions. But after that, it gets harder and harder to believe, and I had to work harder and harder to load the dice so that the story would go the way I wanted to. If, if, if you go back and look at it, uh, you'll see that those dice really are very heavily loaded. But again, it was only intended to be something for fun, for entertainment, not to be taken seriously at all. Okay, fine. Um... I noticed, uh, in my, my own personal reading of your work, I noticed an absence of the old science fiction bug-eyed monster type of alien. Uh, most of the aliens that I recall from your work are, are fairly peaceful. They're interested in communicating, and, and you seem to be writing about the possible benefits between the between mm -hmm. two different species. Uh, do you think there will be other life in the universe and that it will be friendly, or at least uh, that we can communicate with it meaningfully? Well, there's no way... There's no way to tell, of course. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, but on the most realistic and conservative basis, um, yes, it would seem likely that there's a good deal of life out there. That, that life is something which happens um, forever wherever conditions are right. It seems to have had a certain inevitability here on Earth. No. On how many other planets, we can't tell, but even if it happens on only 1% of the stars in the galaxy, you know, one, one planet for 1% of the stars in the galaxy, that's still an awful lot. Let's see, 10 to the... Uh, that's still a billion uh, planets with life on them in this one galaxy. Um... And I suspect it could happen oftener than that, but, you know, that, that's kind of a conservative guess. Uh, that, out of those, how many produce intelligent life? And out of those, how many produce technological civilizations like ours that could conceivably communicate with us? We don't know. But you can whittle away a lot of uh, percentage points and still come out with a fair number. Um, and um, although I have written stories uh, postulating situations where there was war and other unpleasantness, um, that was, again, under certain rather special assumptions, if you try to look at it under the most conservative uh, and believable assumptions, it all seems very unlikely. You ask yourself uh, what the dickens there would be to fight about. Uh, we, we probably wouldn't want each other's real estate. I remarked earlier that uh, it isn't likely there'll be very many planets in the galaxy where people could live unaided. Um, it seems, by the same token, it seems unlikely that anybody else would covet our real estate um, and it's hard to see what other rivalries we could have uh, on the other hand we could stand to gain a tremendous amount mutually by exchanging information and ideas and so on well this has happened throughout terrestrial history after all uh, a, uh, the most progressive parts of the world have been precisely those where different societies met each other and interacted. No, I don't think... I, I, I doubt very much that we have anything to fear. We have everything to gain. Okay, specifically, uh, two, two of your aliens that... that um 
what I have a question about. Number one is the uh, the short story Kiri, the uh, the the short story that you wrote entitled Kiri. Yes. The uh, the energy creature named Lucifer. Yes. Uh, now he was destroyed at the end of the story, correct? Who was right? He was destroyed, was he not, Lucifer? Oh, oh yes, of course. Um, uh, I was, what I wanted to ask, though, about the story was the um, the origin, the genesis of your idea behind that. Was there any kind of inspiration that uh, made you come up with that particular story? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, that story was suggested by something very specific uh, that I read, oh, quite a few years ago now, an article in uh, a magazine called Science, which is the journal of the American Association for the advancement of science. There was an article by Kip Thorne on uh, collapsing stars, uh, what, what, uh, what has since come to be called black holes. At that time, the term hadn't yet been coined. And he had some fascinating things to say about what would happen in the vicinity of a black hole. And I thought, aha, there's a story there. Now let me think a minute. And that was the story which came out, including the business of the different time scales and so on. That, that, that is, well, wasn't my idea. That was Dr. Thorne's. Okay, the, uh, the other alien or group of aliens uh, were the, oh, the, I guess the, the bird people that you come up with on, on the planets, Diomedes, Avalon, Aeneas, and so forth. Yeah. Where did you uh, where did you get the idea of a, of a civilization of uh, winged beings of that sort? Well, as a matter of fact, that's a rather long story in itself, and illustrates how complicated the origins of such things often are. Oh, way back when, many years ago, um, I mean, many years ago, it's about forty by now. Uh, Elspeth de Camp had published an article on intelligent non-human beings. Well, he used basic physical principles to demolish a number of notions, you know, li li like the idea of a giant insect and so on. It's, it's just impossible. It would collapse under its own weight because it hasn't got the structure to support that weight. Things like that. And one thing he doubted was that you could have a, an intelligent being which flies because... Um, the wing loading that a living uh, flyer can absorb is or, or, or take is so small that uh, there just wouldn't be room for a sizable brain. Um, he pointed out that the biggest flying creature we've got uh, the California condor uh, weighs only about 25 pounds. That doesn't leave much room for brains. Well, science fiction writers tend to take this sort of a thing as a challenge. And so when I wrote The Man, for Count, who, the Man Who Counts quite a while ago, um, I did have winged intelligent beings, but I designed a planet such that it had a very dense atmosphere which, of course, would make it easier to get about in the air. I also made them essentially six-limbed so that they could have not only wings but legs and hands. Well, afterward, I got to thinking that that had been a kind of a cop-out. Couldn't there be some way to do it better? Um, could it conceivably be done on an Earth-like planet? I couldn't see any way. Um... The camp's arguments were there, and they made sense. Well, then it happened the very last time I saw the late John W. Campbell. We, I was in New York and visited his office, and we went out to lunch together. This was not long before his death. And we sat there talking, and I raised the question just off the top of my head, mammalian animal be like? Well, the first thing he said was, uh, it would be intelligent and it's us. And I said, no, 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 that wasn't what I was thinking about. Uh, suppose there were no intelligence, what would such a thing be like physically? 
And he immediately said, well, suppose it had some sort of leg-driven um, supercharging bellows that would give it tremendous cursive ability. And I immediately saw that this was a way to power a winged animal, give it, give it sufficient energy that it actually could fly in an atmosphere like our own. Um, although it might weigh as much as 100 pounds. Uh, just a second. We've... Well, it happened a lot. Okay, we're rolling again. Um, okay. I really just have about three more questions. All right. um, one is in uh, the, the Conan novel you did, Conan the Rebel. Yes. I was interested in how you got involved in writing that uh, on the Conan series. Oh, this was very simple. One day the uh, telephone rang and I picked it up and there was Elspreg de Camp at the other end of the line. Uh, he was involved in a project to generate a few more Conan novels and would I be interested? And, well, I'd always enjoyed Conan. And without going into detail, I ended up thinking, what the dickens, why not do it? And 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 I had fun doing it. You know, it, it, it didn't pretend to be literature or anything. It was just a swashbuckler, but I enjoyed doing it, and uh, I hope readers have enjoyed reading it. Okay, fine. Um, we would also like to know about the... Uh, the the work you're presently doing, you know, what kinds of books you have, what you're working on now, what kind of future plans for things to write that you have? Well, that's a little difficult to say. After, after finishing that Conan book, which I did almost two years ago, I did practically no writing. I was engaged in other things until just very recently, so at the moment, I'm in the middle of a novel. No, not the middle, the early part of a novel. It's going to occupy me for until the middle of summer, at least. It's what my wife calls a, a kitchen sink novel. You throw everything in, including the kitchen sink. Uh, and that's really about all I can say about it right now. You don't have any uh, uh, any kinds of movie rights on any of your books oh, no, no. presently? No, it's merely one that I've contracted to do. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be nice if movie rights or something like that sold, but nothing like that is on the horizon yet. Okay, and, and my third question would be, uh, from your standpoint, you know, having written ever since the 1940s and given the the huge amount of your life that you've given to science fiction. In fact, you were president of the uh, Science Fiction Writers of America also. Uh, uh, do you think science fiction has changed? Oh, yes, there have been a great many changes. Um, back around 1940 or so, um, well, practically all you could get unless you hark back to a few writers like Wells and Verne, uh, practically all you could get was in a few pulp magazines. Um, now, uh, now, nowadays, of course, there's an overwhelming flood of it. Uh, it is not possible to read all which appears. Um, and also, of course, uh, it's no longer disreputable. It's become quite respectable. There are, you know, when I when I was your age, it was unthinkable that anybody could arrange a telephone interview with one of the writers of it under the auspices of a college, for heaven's sake. Good Lord, this was pulp fiction. It was beyond the pale. Uh, nowadays, it's being taught in college courses and all, you know, all, all this other stuff, you know. Um, and it has sort of, but actually all this is kind of trivial. I think the important thing is that the basic concepts have sort of 
permeated the public mind. Um, I think people are aware na nowadays in a way that they never e used to be aware that the future is going to be different from the past. It may be better, it may be worse, uh, whatever, but it's going to be different in, and in very fundamental ways. And they tend to accept this, be prepared for it, and then also you get well if I want I, I often say that perhaps the most important public service that science fiction is doing is by casting a certain glamour over science and technology, it recruits a lot of young people into these fields, and good heaven knows we need an awful lot of scientists and technologists. <laughs>